Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I'm glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Latoya Ruby Fraser and Margot Norton. This program series includes over a dozen artist conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum digital initiatives are generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I will now share brief biographical notes about this program's featured artist. Latoya Ruby Fraser creates works in photography, video, and performance that center on issues of social justice, cultural change, and experiences of individuals who are often dehumanized or overlooked by mainstream media. Fraser's work has been the subject of numerous solo presentations, and recent exhibitions have included the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Seattle Art Museum, Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, Contemporary Art Museum Houston, Musée de Art Contemporains, in Belgium, CAPC in France, Car d'Art Musée d'Art Contemporain de Nîmes, France, the Silver Eye Center for Photography in Pittsburgh, the August Wilson Center also in Pittsburgh, the Frost Art Museum Miami, the Musée d'Art Moderne in Luxembourg, and the Newcomb Museum at Tulane University, New Orleans. In 2020, her work, The Last Cruise, was the subject of a solo exhibition at Chicago's Renaissance Society and the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus. A catalog for the exhibition, published by the Renaissance Society, includes contributions by Coco Fusco, David Harvey, Werner Lang, Lynn Nottage, and Benjamin J. Young, as well as extensive documentation. Frazier's work is included in celebrated international collections, and she is a 2015 recipient of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. In 2020, Frazier was named the inaugural recipient of the Gordon Parks Foundation Statel Prize for artists whose practices reflect and extend Gordon Parks' legacy of using photography as a tool to advance social justice. And now, a few logistical notes. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located on the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. And now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to New Museum Curator, Margot Norton. Thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you to everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm so honored to be here today with Latoya Ruby Frazier to speak about her incredible work, uh, which is included in our Grief and Grievance exhibition at the New Museum, an exhibition originally conceived by the late legendary curator Okui and Weser, and overseen by a team of advisors, including Naomi Beckwith, Glenn Ligon, Mark Nash, and Massimano Joni. Uh, I first saw your work, uh, Latoya, at the New Museum, in fact, uh, in the Triennial Exhibition uh, in 2009. I wasn't working at New Museum at that time, but seeing that work just blew me away. Um, and I remember that you showed a selection from your uh, notion of, of family series then, uh, when you were in the midst of working on the project, uh, which is also on view in the Grief and Grievance exhibition. Uh, actually, I wanted to start out uh, asking you about your relationship with uh, the curator, uh, Okuyen Weser, uh, who originated the Grief and Grievance show and sadly passed away during the course of working on the show uh, almost exactly two years ago uh, on Monday. I know that you knew each other and I wanted to start asking, uh, actually, if you remember the first time that you met Okui. Yeah, um, thank you. 
for having me here tonight and requesting to do this conversation with me. There's so many brilliant people in the exhibition. Um, yeah, so I had the, the privilege and the honor to study with Oakley and Wazar through the Whitney Independent Study Program in 2010 and 11. Uh, it really stood out to me because very seldom do you ever get uh, teachers that are of the African diaspora or even Black Americans leading courses that are about left Marxist theory. And so it really was important to me to get to hear his um, poetry and his uh, theoretical beliefs. Uh, and also um, he talked about uh, the Black Audio Collective. Um, Hans Werf's song was the film he played and discussed with us in that seminar. Uh, the other time that I spent time with Oakley was when I went to Munich while I was at the American Academy of Berlin. I actually met him at Hausterkens. He invited me to give me a tour. And we just spent some time walking through the museum. I remember there was a, a Matthew Barney solo exhibition on view. And these are just profound moments that you can't get back. And I never knew that Oakley was planning on showing the notion of family because he never discussed my work with me. Mm. And so it was really deeply touching to see that he did see my work as a part of this longer conversation around global capital and the exploitation of uh, Black and African and Indigenous people around the world. And so it's just an honor and remarkable, a remarkable time to be included in such a um, an exhibition with this kind of vision, understanding and compassion and humanity and just to honor and remember him because we really uh, lost someone really important. Yeah, definitely, cheers. Um, and actually we're gonna pull up a, a little slideshow uh, that has some images of uh, Latoya's work uh, in the exhibition. Um, and uh, I thought we could start out speaking about the notion of family series, which uh, is included uh, in Grief and Grievance, um, and then move towards some of their more recent projects. Uh, and um, this series, um, if we could actually scroll through the slides a little bit, just to get a sense of the, the images a little closer up, um, centers on your family's experiences living in the town where you were born and raised of Braddock, Pennsylvania, which is a steel town outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and I just wanted to start uh, asking if you could talk a little bit about Braddock, uh, the history of the town, your relationship to it, and how this series began. Yeah, so, you know, Braddock is located nine miles outside of Pittsburgh along the ancient Monongahela River. And I think this is important. Like, Braddock belonged to Queen Aliquippa. This is before George Washington came. This is before the Scotsman John Fraser, who existed before the camera, so there's no portrait of him, um, before they came and took over that land. And before it was industrial, it belonged to indigenous people. There was also a black community quietly there before Carnegie built over these 300 sprawling acres of the steel mill industry that is actually currently still there. So I wanna be clear about that with the audience. When we talk about a post-industrial economy, when we talk about towns like Braddock becoming the poster child for rust built revitalization, and we're asking artists to go in and gentrify them and beautify them, you have to remember Braddock is still a steel mill town. The contradiction and discrepancy is that it does not employ the predominant black Americans that currently live there within the steel mill that is currently emitting so many pollutants and toxins and was actually increased under Trump's administration that it is killing them even more. Uh, I think that's really important that we understand that. Also, they began um, fracking and Democrats also supported it in, the, in their own um, you know, conquest for power, right? The politics and the games our politicians play. And so it's just um, important that we don't lose sight of the fact that this is still an industrial town with elderly people, working class people, single parent households, people that are very vulnerable underneath this pandemic. Hmm. I read that you uh, were make, creating photographs uh, since you were 16. And I wanted to ask if you remember what those first photographs were like. Um, yeah, <laughs> you're not in the book. <laughs> but um, to speak to that, I actually began with a Polaroid camera. It was the last week of high school. I went to Woodland Hills Senior High School. Our school was not desegregated until 1981, our school district. So understand 14th Amendment had already passed. 
But in Pennsylvania, in Allegheny County, the school system was not desegregated until I was one years old. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about how uh, one day looking at everybody on the bus, remembering we survived the war on drugs. Like we're all about to graduate tomorrow. Let me, let me pull out this camera and just photograph all my friends on this school bus because I realized for us to reach that moment was significant because we weren't meant to survive the war on drugs uh, that happened. It is a part of Ronald Reagan's policy. Um, Nancy Reagan was certainly the one spearheading it through the Say No to Drugs campaign, which spilled into our classroom. So you have to imagine, we are in middle school trying to just get our education. And instead, Nancy Reagan has the Say No to Drugs campaign and your class is being interrupted by canines and police officers. They're giving us t-shirts and water bottles and basketballs that say, you know, just say no to drugs. You know, your community is bad. So, you know, this is our home, our community, the people we know, and we're being told at a very young age that we're the ones that are bad and violent and criminals. And I think that that left a, a very strong mark on all of us. And it made a lot of us determined um, to graduate with high honors and to go on and be able to help our families since so much had been removed from us. And so those images I keep in a box, I've never shown them. It was just for me, uh, something I needed to do to mark the moment that we did graduate, we graduated with good grades, regardless of all the structural and systemic racist abuse we were facing. And we were teenagers, we didn't know. And the language I speak with now, I didn't have then. And that's why the notion of family took 14 years to make, because I'm coming of age in a post Reagan policy, right? Looking at all of this damage that happened to our community. And so that was just uh, significant for me to do those. And that is pretty much what jump starts the notion of family when it began once I entered undergrad. Mm. And um, I wanted to ask about in the notion of family and in subsequent uh, work as well, this decision um, to work in black and white photography. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, yeah, just curious to know a little bit about um, this decision, you know, of course, it's like more of a traditional photographic format and the silver gelatin print, um, but one that I think is significant. So I, I wanted to, yeah, to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, um, well, my mentor, Kathy Kowalski, um, she was very strong on uh, feminist discourse, literature, and then on social documentary work. And so, one of the images that stood out for me in a class about Roland Barthes punked him in a studio in a photograph. Uh, someone brought in um, Florence Owens Thompson, the migrant mother. And I understood it as a picture of a woman with her two children, but the more I looked at that image and thought about the fact that Dorothea Lange's voice and field notes were removed, she was removed from the assignment or he striker fires her. And then of course, Florence Owens Thompson never receives royalties, no payments, her children don't receive payments for it. That is actually what caused me to ask the question when I was making the work with my mother and my grandmother in Braddock, well, what would Florence Owens Thompson's self portraits look like had she photographed them herself? Or how do I take the symbolic um, hierarchy and power structures, right? These structures of power in the 1930s when we look at social documentary in this country, these aren't simply images of farm workers struggling or how FDR's policies saved them. What I actually see is a structure of power and a paradigm that puts the government and corporations above workers and their families and their communities. And those images are not in service to the subjects, but rather to empower and to prove the uh, political agenda of the government or the corporation. And so I'm trying to rotate and shift that paradigm in this work, which means redistributing the power, who authors the image, who narrates the image, who gets the proceeds from those images. That's what's at the heart of this work. Yeah, totally. Um, there's, I think it, it, you know, there's a really important difference, I think, between the images you take in photojournalism. And uh, there was something actually that uh, Maurice Berger said in talking about your work 
that I like a lot, which is um, that you're approaching, when you approach photog photography, you're approaching it as a, from a position of a vulnerable insider, as opposed to like a curious or concerned outsider, um, which I think is important. And another difference I think really lies in this word collaboration. Um, and uh, I would actually like to go to this slide um, of Latoya and her mom, because I feel like those works that you did with your mother um, really um, are, you know, really true collaborations. Um, and, uh, you know, that idea of collaboration really sets what you do apart from this history of photography associated with those power dynamics of the, those behind the lens and those in front of it. I mean, this, for example, is a series of your mother taking an image of you. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about this collaborative process, uh, you know, it, with your mother in this series, but, you know, in other works as well. I feel like it's very important to your practice. Yes, um, you know, my mom, from the very moment I brought my 35 millimeter camera home, she was ready. She was directing the shots and it got so much to the point, it's like, well, when are you coming home? So in the notion of family, what viewers are actually seeing over 14 years are holiday visits home. Mm. These are mostly during Christmas, Thanksgiving, um, summer breaks, and then of course, when there are um, serious medical emergencies occurring when I would need to return home to advocate for her, be at her side. And so that's important to understand that. And also um, she really wanted to be seen, but on her terms. And I think what makes her brilliant and a genius is that she actually subverts Roland Barr's death in a photograph. And she herself in discussing our images, and we have done talks together before, um, that you know she understands that the moment the shutter clicks, she is no longer that person. And her whole point of asking me to make photographs of her, even when she was vulnerable or intoxicated. I mean, my mom, we're drinking Budweiser sometimes in the images. Like I am not separate from my working class background and the fact that bar culture is a part of all of this as well. And so she knows, uh, is setting the terms. And I think even in that image that you just had up in the mirror, you see the cable release is actually in my mother's hands. You see how she's at her side in the doorway. And then you see my medium format camera and then I'm kind of standing there. And I think like that's where the heightened awareness actually occurs within this, this photograph and composition. Um, and so we would make time, we would build out space where we were turning these domestic interiors really into a stage where we could photograph or mimic each other or take moments to acknowledge each other's sameness and difference. But it rotates around holidays or rotates around surgeries. And, you know, I have a terminal illness like lupus and she battles that as well as um, different forms of cancer having to be removed from her. And so there's a lot that we're dealing with internally and within the domestic space that has everything to do with areas. I wanted to um, move next to the image actually of your, um, your grandmother, um, because something else I noticed in this series is uh, your grandmother's doll collection and this image, but also there's a following image um, which shows the neat arrangement of the dolls all around, uh, yeah, the, the fireplace. And when I saw this image, um, you know, I was thinking about your grandmother uh, as an artist, actually. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have a lot of collectors in my family as well. And I was thinking about, um, you know, in a way like your mother is also an artist and, you know, in your collaboration that you do together, um, you know, as well as, and, and your grandmother. And I wanted to ask if you also kind of see them as artists in this and, you know, that, that question of, you know, lineage, like in terms of your, your relationship. Yeah, um, so in my family, there are artists. My, my Aunt Tony actually liked art and uh, one of her paintings is on the wall there to the right of where I'm shooting. Um, my father uh, went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Uh, he has a degree in interior design and is also an artist. Um, and my mom has always been interested in the arts, although she's probably more like a performance artist. But in the book, you know, when you go back and reread the notion of family, I distinctly, as you see here in the title, 
call it Grandma Ruby's installation. Uh, I think what she was doing um, was reinforcing to me just because we were in a poor zip code and impoverished community, it didn't mean that inside that I you know, wasn't worth more. So I think she was trying to teach me things about class by reinforcing these types of installations and images of all our family members. Um, also, in terms of loss, I mean, my grandmother started this collection when my aunt Midgey was murdered. Um, that's when I realized she started the collection. And I think that, you know, when we have a loss like that, someone who like, like her real name is Diane, but my aunt Midgey was like the centerpiece of the family. My mother always talks about how she looked up to her. And the older I got, the more they would say, you know, you remind me of Midgey. And I think that, you know, when we lose someone that substantial, that is like an anchor and a surrogate to everyone, um, it, it restructures the family. It also restructures our own growth or who we might have thought we would have been or what we would have liked to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important how we're all connected in that way. And so I also look at this image sometimes and I realize she started that collection and I think it had a lot to do with her suffering and grief of losing my Aunt Midgey. Mm -hmm. um Actually, the, the, the following image um, uh, has a, I, I included a text with it. Um, and you're, uh, you know, the text here is what's next to this image in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask about these texts um, that you use to accompany your images. Also in the Grief and Grievance exhibition, we have texts that, that accompany the, the images in the show. Um, and these texts and titles as well often name your subjects, yourself included, uh, and tell the stories of, of them, uh, which are in, incredibly powerful. Um, and um, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about this process of writing these texts um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, what, what it's like, is it, is it in tandem with the images? Does it come later? Like, yeah, basically like how, how, how that process uh, for you uh, works. Yeah, um, you know, I was uh, looking a lot at, um, you know, Langston Hughes and Gordon Parks and just thinking about poetry and images and kind of in the notion of family, I'm using the text that is sometimes my mother's voice, my grandmother's voice or my voice. Other times it's from real documents, real lawsuits, real policies, real economic policies that impacted the way the community would be structured or dismantled, which of course impacted our family and which ultimately impacts the way that I perceive my own self-portrait or myself. Um, what people have to understand about Braddock is it truly, before the city of Pittsburgh existed, it was the biggest city. It was the biggest hub. That's the one misconception that people don't realize, even though these are nine miles apart, Pitts, downtown Pittsburgh and Braddock. Braddock existed first. And that means that everyone, no matter what your ethnicity, nationality, or race was, in order to work in Carnegie's Mill, you had to grow up around Ninth and Talbert, which is where all the row homes were, where he kept the workers so that they're only working in the factory and not going anywhere else. And so that created a real melting pot culturally. Um, many people from there are actually mixed. But of course, here in America, we go by these very oversimplified categories of black and white. But when you really start to interview people or talk to them about their history, their culture, their heritage, it's, it's much more um, complex than that. Um, and then this portrait in particular, uh, this is after I've uh, buried my grandmother and I'm actually wearing her pajama pants. And so this is me having a lupus attack, which is an autoimmune disorder. I can trace the pollutants and toxins from the Ecker Thompson Steelworks, which is owned by the United States Steel Corporation, which has been cited since 2017 for exceeding the EPA levels over 400 times. Within the last three years, they've exceeded it. So you have to imagine when I'm growing up there in the 80s, how horrific this actually was. And so as a kid growing up, um, it was normal to have the highest asthma rate, the highest infant mortality rate, all the pre-existing conditions that people are dealing with today around COVID, we had the highest numbers when I was growing up. Our lead levels were far worse than Flint, Michigan's when I was growing up. And the city and the state, they knew that these 
these violations were there, but they did nothing. Sure. Um, and so the only thing I could think to do as someone who was powerless and didn't have any influence was to start making these images. So these images are not simply self-portraits. They're very symbolic and indicative of an actual system that is there to, you know, annihilate my existence as well as the women who remained, right? Because at this point, the workforce has died off, soldiers have died, and the war on drugs removed men from our household. So this is strategically done. Right. This is how you dismantle and break a community and then cause black women in particular to be vulnerable and reliant on the same state that is murdering them. And so, again, the only way to attest or to have a testimony to that is to document myself. And so the portraits, when I appear, I'm often having a lupus attack and in a great deal of pain. And um, and. I thought we could move actually to, you know, kind of going from the the micro or the personal yeah. to these like kind of bigger landscape views that are included in the in the series, because actually, you know, I, I, I really love that experience of like that zooming in and out that you do with this work. Um, uh, like continually, like as you walk through it, you know, there's like these these aerial shots, these landscapes, these domestic scenes, and then these very personal uh, experiences like that. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that sequence and that idea of zooming in and out and like how that carries out in this series and and, and in, in other works too. Yeah, so actually here, the photograph is functioning as an excavation, as an archeological dig, because that Bach gases where you're seeing this rezone light industry for this international global corporation to be there. It is actually the site where I grew up. Um, it's called the Talbot Towers. It was built in 1956. I lived in there as a newborn um, with my mother and my father and my brother and sister. And I actually want to read this text because I'm not sure if it's on the wall label in the exhibition. I think it might be, but I want to read it to the audience, especially for those of you who can't make it to the show. Um, this is how this image is actually contextualized in the book. Behind this 1980s Mercury Grand Marquis, where the Bach gases now stands, is the former site of the Talbot Towers, a 210-unit Allegheny County housing project where I was born and raised, between 9th and 10th Street on Washington Avenue. Built in 1956, Talbot Towers was demolished in 1990, two years after resident Cheryl Sanders and her neighbors filed a housing discrimination lawsuit that claimed Allegheny County clustered black residents in public housing into certain communities. In 1994, the Federal, Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development's admission that it was party to a decades long system of discriminatory housing resulted in the Fair Housing Service Center. The Saunders Consent Decree gave Allegheny County an opportunity to desegregate. So I'm a child living there when this happens. And what's interesting, and this continues on in the notion of family, it picks up with a different image of, of other houses with greenery over them as they're falling apart. The settlement came in. The organizations were there to hold the money from this lawsuit and settlement. But interestingly, what happens, I never move out of here. I, all, I end up moving one block over into my grandmother's house because all of the surrounding white suburbs where we were supposed to in the settlement have access to move into those communities to desegregate them, they created a counter lawsuit so that we could never move in and desegregate those neighborhoods. So I am just a child already having my life shaped and dictated by racism, systemic racism, by inequality around housing. And it's just interesting how generationally, if you look back through, you know, my grandmother growing up there in the 30s, my mother growing up there in the 60s, and then me growing up there in the 80s, these are all economic policies and laws there to stop us from being able to have upward mobility. That is how these communities become Black. It's not about Black people not having ingenuity or hope and dreams to move on to other places. We are systemically being oppressed and trapped into these places. But these are our own white counterparts in our community filing a lawsuit, a counter lawsuit against the county because they don't want us to live with them. It's, uh, no, I, it's, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And actually, like, I'm thinking about how 
you know, these wider views are personal, like how personal they are and how this idea of excavation that, that, that you, that you brought up is kind of in everything, whether it is something that's like inside, you know, a, a person, but how it relates to those, those also those larger, larger views. Um, and that's also the battle of the Monongahela. Mm. This is the battleground. So all of that bloodshed, the French and Indian War, this is actually the actual site. Mm. So all of that compounded. And then you wonder why there isn't any equality or any change or why Black people and Indigenous people still don't have access or rights to our so-called constitution or democracy in this country. Right. Layers upon layers upon layers. Um, and uh, just to move on, because I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk about the more recent projects. Um, this is actually the last image that I have of the in here of the uh, a notion of family. But I wanted to ask about how you kind of decided to end this series mm -hmm. and then move on to subsequent projects such as Flynn's family uh, and, you know, you know, documenting the lives of those people that were affected by the city's water crisis. Mm -hmm. And what was it like to kind of move from documenting your own experience to, to those of others? Yeah, so here this is significant because it's about UPMC, which is a nonprofit global, nonprofit global healthcare corporation that pretty much employs a lot of people in Pittsburgh. Coincidentally, although it pays its CEO over $8 million, this same nonprofit healthcare giant actually oppresses and attacks its workers for wanting to unionize or for wanting a living wage. Um, this goes hand in hand with seeing as Ed Clunan and members of the Save Our Community Hospital activist group who taught me civil disobedience and taught me, you know, it's time to stop making the photographs in the house with mom and grandma and get on the streets and protest because your community hospital is being taken. This shows you them holding the signs that, you know, point to the fact that it's a, it's a nonprofit healthcare global corporation that's closing U.S. hospitals and working class communities that have been left behind with populations that are dying from environmental toxicity, from industrial pollution, and yet opening up hospitals internationally around the globe. Like there's a problem here with this for-profit healthcare system that can attack its workers, abandon people that need access to healthcare, and then open up globally in multiple places like it's a massive food chain. So this is what Save Our Com Community Hospital activists wanted to do. And I thought I would drive from New York from the Whitney Independent Study Program to Braddock three times a week, meet them wherever they wanted me to meet. And in this particular day, you see them destroying our community hospital. And this is personal and political to me because my grandmother was one of the last residents born and raised in there that died in the hospital before we would learn on the news. 11 o'clock news that we were losing our hospital because they claimed it was underutilized and losing money, which was an outright lie. So it required me to get involved with understanding policies, laws, economic theory, and then showing up for other people, visually caring and looking after other people so that there's a human document and evidence that people did protest. It's just that mass media, because it's owned by six major corporations, if you look up those owners and you see who they are, they're not interested in telling stories about working class people. And so that's where someone like myself has the idea and the will and the passion to make longer sustained documentary photo essays and stories that run parallel to mainstream media and mass media so that I'm able to reveal like, well, here are your cultural blind spots. Here are your prejudices. Here are the stories that actually can help us sharpen you know, our laws and policies and other voices that actually do matter to these choices that are being made that are impacting our lives by local elected officials that again, are only interested in amassing and consolidating power instead of doing the work that the people who elected them have asked them to do. So um, kind of moving from, from this to the, to the Flynn's family series, um, I, yeah, I'm just uh, thinking about like how this body of work started um, and, you know, this, yeah, this decision to like start to work uh, with, uh, you know, people other than yourselves to document their experiences as well. Yeah, so that's uh, Shay Cobb with the hat on, standing with her mother, Miss Renee, and her daughter, Zion. 
And when Elle and Hers Corporation approached me to do, it's a commission. So this is a distinction, right? I'm not a photojournalist. I'm being brought in to build like sections for magazines or cover urgent contemporary topics that have not been addressed in a lot of these publications. Um, and so I was asked and I said, you know, I would only do it on the condition that you introduced me to another multi-generational family that has been on that land for a very long time. Similar to Braddock, Flint, Michigan, what is it? An industrial town, an industrial black working class town that is abandoned by another giant corporation like the automotive giant corporation, General Motors. Um, we have systemically endured the same type of corporate and government abuse. That is, we are coming through the great migration, moving into the workforce. We see in this country that by the 70s and 80s, when black workers were ab about to start to get a footing working, you know, instead of blue collar, white collar, or starting to get, you know, those jobs and positions that were only designated for white workers, or starting to come up in the ranks within the union itself, that suddenly, suddenly these corporations become international, right? They have the union busting under Reagan, the removal of social services, and bam, the global market through neoliberal capitalism, now, the, now all the jobs are leaving the country. This happens coincidentally as the black workforce is starting to unionize and amass power. This is not a coincidence. It is a part of it. And this is why you see the kind of destruction with beautiful black bodies kind of disseminated amongst all of that decadence and chaos from these corporations, right? It's a system designed to repeat it. And so it was natural for me to arrive to Flint and get to know Shay and learn the layout of the city and do the story in six months versus 14 years by following her school bus routes because she was a school bus driver in the city of Flint. And then of course, having this incredible relationship with her daughter, Zion. Zion is part of the population of children who are eight years old, six to eight years old, being affected by this water crisis. When the lead enters into a child's body, the first place the lead is going to latch on to is their brain. And this is why this is devastating that over 8,000 children's lives were destroyed permanently because Governor Rick Snyder was a part of a plan to start the KWA line, which was about privatizing our water, which is a basic human right. They were privatizing it for profit and they didn't care that they exposed these children and caused a lot of calamity because there was also Legionnaire's disease. Then when they tried to clean up the water, they put too much chloride in it. It gave off another cancerous substance. This is state sanctioned murder and he got away with it or a little smack on the wrist. There is no, um, he's not really apologizing, right? He pleaded not guilty. This was all a scheme to privatize the water so that they could put the Detroit Water Company out of business so that they could justify having a new water pipeline called the KWA. I mean, this is very scary when you can show visually through telling these personal stories about everyday working people just trying to live amongst it and you realize it's the same pervasive pernicious system. And when it is a black working class population like this, there is only one term to describe it. It is racial capitalism, right? This is through brute force and systemic violence. Also both Braddock and Flint looking the way that they do today, that is because of structural racism and spatial racism. These, these theories and understandings are very much um, implemented in these systemic ways where you need the cooperation of local elected officials, as well as politicians, as well as governors, and as well as lawyers and the mass media who refused to tell the real stories like how Shea Cobb and Amber Hassan were able to get an atmospheric water generator brought to their community so they themselves could be the change they needed to get free clean water to the city of Flint. Two women did that, not these white men. Two black women brought the solution to their community and their children. Um, yeah, this, these, yeah, these images are amazing. And, um, 
I, uh, yeah, I actually wanted to uh, ask you about the book project that you're working on currently, because I know you often publish books, uh, like the one that you're working on right now for, uh, with State for the Flynn's Family, and the one that you recently published with Renaissance Society for the Last Cruise. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit about that process uh, of working on these books and how it's so central to, to, to what you do. So uh, during this pandemic, I can honestly actually say I made two books during the pandemic. Quarantine will do that to you. So I'm like going off screaming at my walls and I'm like, I got to channel this. To do it. It's time to do the books. Just do the work. And so for me, I always know that I'm making what I see as like these photo history books, which are revisions to the histories. Um, and are a counter to the half-truths, prejudices, and false facts that are mediated to us. So for example, here I am in Bottle West, which is Zion's favorite restaurant. This is during the Flint water crisis. And in this series, you see uh, two different frames where like Shay's looking off, thinking about, you know, headed to Mississippi to take a reprieve and a break from the water crisis where she lives in the South, where her father lives on 90 acres of land, where she has her own fresh water spring, her own fruit trees, right? She's going to live self-sufficient with her own water. And in the industrial North, this is the systemic injustice she and her daughter are facing. So she has to do the reverse migration back South to the land in order to escape this briefly and take a break. And that's where her father teaches her and Zion how to take care of the land where they also have Tennessee walking horses. Zion already has her own Tennessee walking horse. I mean, this is pretty amazing. And the problem and the reason why none of you have seen these images yet, unless you made it to SFMOMA uh, right before the pandemic started is because nobody would publish these images. And I said to them, I said, you know, to Elle and to all these other editors I knew, like, why are you only interested in telling a story of victimization of people during the Flint water crisis? Why not tell the story about perseverance and the courage and the strength and determination that Shay and Zion are actually displaying, right? They're not dying in the midst of this crisis, which was designed to, to exterminate them. They're not dying. And actually, America deserves to see these images where Zion is proudly sitting propped up on a Tennessee walking horse and her mother, right, instead of these like racist white men on Tennessee walking horses, which Tennessee walking horses symbolically mean um, they were used on plantations but with overseers riding atop them to watch over slaves because they walk with a smooth gait. So a Tennessee walking horse to me is symbolic of the Deep South. And it's important to create this image, right? To shift from the industrial North pollution with the water crisis, which is man-made by the way, it's a man-made crisis. We've never had this before. And then all of a sudden switch over to the fact that she's a victor, right? On a Tennessee walking horse. I mean, that is the best visual retribution ever for me. And so, you know, it's important to follow the series and it's why I'm publishing Flint is Family in Three Acts, which is coming out this fall through Gerhard Steidel and the Gordon Parks Foundation, which is part of their inaugural book prize about Gordon Parks. And um, just thinking about how Parks made beautiful, colorful images in the South and looked at segregation in the South. I think this is such a, an important contribution to his legacy and his vision, but also people need to see this book because the entire Flint water crisis, the story is told by Amber and Shay. The voices and the reporting and the story is reported by the people themselves. Really? Even Zion, even Shay's father, Mr. Smiley, has his own chapter, right? I think that we are, um, I think our culture and country deserves to hear stories, to hear news and real stories reported by the people that are trapped at the intersection of these calamities, because they are actually the ones that have the creative solutions. They're the ones that have the will and the power to have the testimonies and to set the record straight. And so I'm really excited and I hope people will buy that book because 
you'll see that in three different acts. And also it proves the, the importance of the power of the photograph and also the importance and role of an artist in our, in our society, what we're actually supposed to do. So in act one, it's a revision of telling the water crisis. Act two, it's about visualizing a, a hidden narrative like her going to the South, inheriting all this land and water. And then act three is about the photograph actually being the driving force of the catalyst in the change, right? The image is not about being a pretty picture in a frame on a wall in this series. It actually is the thing that generates the resource to bring the 26,000 pound atmospheric water generator to Flint, Michigan. And so these are three different acts that talk about the way to enact in a photograph to act on behalf and with a community and people. Mm. And the same is true in the uh, Last Cruise series um, that you did. Uh, I saw this show. I'm so happy that I did in Chicago at the Renaissance Society. It's amazing installation. Um, and, you know, this one too, you know, the text was very important, you know, about in terms of telling everyone's stories um, that are involved, uh, you know, with this, uh, uh, you know, issues happening at General Motors. Um, and yeah, I wanted to actually, I think this is a good, a good work also to talk a little bit about the sequencing. There's some other images here that it gets a little bit closer to the, to the photographs. Um, and the next one as well, where you can see that, um, yeah, the pace of this and the whole experience of kind of going through this and, 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 see, and reading about all those individual stories was really uh, incredible. Um, yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, it's intergenerational storytelling. So you have the eldest people who have been there at this particular plant and location in Lordstown from the beginning in the 1960s. Then you have their children, right, who are now either the head of the union or working somewhere in management. Um, and then on here, you see once they close the plant, March 6th, the last cruise vehicle comes off the assembly line, the workers are locked out, they no longer can go into the plant. That's when you start seeing the portraits of them at home. And that's when you start hearing interviews with their children. So this is very important that I was able to tell this story intergenerationally. Um, also that I was able to publish their voices in a 19 page photo essay in the New York Times in their money issue, which is huge because it's <laughs> the money issue of the New York Times is supposed to be for corporations. And they actually had the audacity to let me have 19 pages and to let the cover be a photograph of a United Auto Worker Union member. But what I'm doing is subverting that because most Americans will think, oh yeah, I'm just gonna see the, a white man in Northeast Ohio. And that's not what you saw. That cover is two women. It's a black woman named Keisha Scales and in her closest coworker, Beverly, who had just retired when I met her to make this photograph where you see Keisha Scales crying, hugging her because Beverly was just at a loss. She's like, if they force you to leave, I'm, what am I gonna do without you? And so I was seeing these very intimate moments because they couldn't go to work anymore. So the concept of the last cruise is there's family at the plant on the assembly line, right? Making the car. And they're making it out of coils of steel, which by the way, could have potentially came from the Edgar Thompson plant in Braddock, right? These coils of steel that then go to Lordstown to be molded into a car. Like I could see that they made these cars with their hands. So, you have the family on the line, then you have the family members at the union hall because they're all brothers and sisters in the United Auto Workers Union of locals 11, 12, and 17, 14. And then you have them at home with their blood relatives. I wanna point out in this particular image here, not only is, is this image of Keisha and Beverly subverting what we think an auto worker is, the next rung is Jonathan Aki hugging his mother. He followed follow his father's footsteps and wanted to be just like him. And he almost did. And in the interview, he's talking about how he's just falling short because he's being forced away. He didn't get to fulfill doing what his father did for his family. And he just can't seem to let go of that. And there's just really painful and beautiful things happening in his story and voice. But what the New York Times didn't say and cut out of my interview text is that the reason I was able to get to Keisha and John Aki is because I met them inside the union hall when they were trying to like be each other's emotional support to fill out unemployment papers. 
Keisha Scales and Jonathan Aki are actually best friends. Mm -hmm. And in an interview, they talk to me about why they're best friends, that they share the same family values, that their attitude and beliefs are the same. And this is important for us to understand as Americans. A, it gives you this, this, this hope and this real sense of human dignity and connection between two people that in general, our society would not assume they were friends. And of course, we use the, the polarization of race, class, and gender to keep us apart in addition to other things. And so it's important the way that I'm weaving them all together on each rung, as you see, them kind of slowly unveil themselves. Also, I think that uh, mass media really missed this mark. And this is why I also, running parallel to mass media, told the story again. Mm. Mass media went with the overgeneralization that all the people in Northeast Ohio that are auto workers at this facility were Trump supporters. If you buy the last cruise and you read these interviews yourself, you're gonna find out that actually they were not. Lordstown and the facility sits within a Republican county, but these workers are coming from all the other surrounding counties like Youngstown. So they have a different sense of pride and a different relationship with um, Democrats. This particular union hall, the president's office, the vice president's office, all the people who work on publicity for their union, all covered in photographs and pictures of Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, and Barack Obama. I almost passed out when I saw it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, thank God I got up off my behind and didn't get brainwashed by mass media. And I could see for myself that that is not true about this particular union. Yes, some of the rank and file workers were, but the leaders of this union were absolutely not. And I think that it's dangerous for us to assume it. So this is why I'm doing a service to my countrymen and my countrywomen. Here is the story. <laughs> Read it and learn. You have a prejudice and bias about union workers and a fear of them based on an illusion. The other reason this is such a significant place to go is Lordstown, Ohio at this facility. This is where the wildcat strikes happened in the 70s. This is where the term industrial Woodstock came from. Their parents, John Aki's dad's generation, they were the ones who said to General Motors, we will not let you speed up this line. This is the exact factory that had the fastest assembly line in the world, people. This was it. This is the place. And this is why when they, when they told me Lordstown and I started learning and realizing it, I said, oh, no, I got to photograph this and I need them to tell this history so that other Americans today can see that we have been brainwashed into believing something that wasn't true. Those workers had the right to do that. Also, this connects directly to Flint, Michigan, because I was sitting in Dave Green's office, the president of this union hall, the day Keisha Scales walked in and she said, Dave, I'm not gonna wait to be forced to transfer. I'm gonna volunteer and I'm gonna go to Flint. And I was sitting on the chair when she said it and I jumped up because I had been in Flint the last four years. And I say, excuse me, um, where are you gonna move when you go? And uh, she was saying she would look around the city of Flint. And I said, just do me a favor, please don't buy property or rent property in the middle of like the fifth ward where Shay lives and some of these other black neighborhoods because the water crisis isn't over. So the CEO and all of their shareholders could have cared less that they forced their own workers into the Flint water crisis. And the only reason that she didn't move there is because I happened to be sitting there. And I said, when I was going there, I was staying 20 miles outside in a community called Grand Blank that is on a water system for Flint Township. So they still get their water from Lake Huron. Please look at apartments there. Mm -hmm. And that's what Keisha ended up doing. And the other thing, when we got the atmospheric water generator up and running in Flint, I called Keisha. And I said, Keisha, we over here are North Saginaw. If you get a break from the line, come over and check out this machine. It was the first time two different bodies of work kind of appeared together. And so we get out the cell phone and we, we make this picture of me and Keisha Scales from the last cruise with me and Shay Cobb and Moses West and Amber Hassan. And Moses had Keisha press the button to turn on the atmospheric water generator. I mean, I can't make this stuff up. And then not even three miles from where we're standing 
in Flint is actually where the Flint, the Flint sit down strike happened. Well, in U.S. history, the Flint sit down strike that occurred in the 30s in America, which gave us unions, which gave us the United Auto Workers, um, that is the same place that started all of this. So all of these histories are, are all intertwined with each other. So both the last cruise and Flint is family is actually about General Motors and corporate abuse and the fact that General Motors polluted the Flint River. And this is the reason that they're dying also from these contaminants. And I mean, millions and millions and millions. I write about it all in the book. Of, of chemicals that they dumped into the Flint River. And this is why it's so egregious that Darnell Early would agree to be the black face of Governor Snyder, forcing austerity measures on these people and then using this authoritarian way of saying, no, even though you voted not to switch to the Flint River, we're gonna override it and do it anyway. And uh, the historian Robin D.G. Kelly um, he, he talks about this in a speech that he gave in Seattle in 2017. And he's been on my mind a lot because he really articulates um, this, this move that we see happening in stories like the Flint water crisis of neoliberalization into racial capitalism. And I think we need to be understanding what these systems are, because these are the systems that are have us all bound up and which are actually kind of enacting a slow violence that is killing all of us. It's not just dividing us, it's literally killing us, but it's killing us slowly. Mm. Um, I, I want to um, move on. I'm sorry to the, to the last question I have. And I, I want to also make sure that we have time for a few questions. Um, but I don't, I, I don't want to miss uh, talking about this project that you did this past summer uh, with the family of Breonna Taylor. And uh, it's worth it to, to note that um, Breonna Taylor was murdered in her home by police exactly one year ago tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about how this project came about uh, and what was it like for you to collaborate with Breonna's family for this, for this series? Yeah, um, thank you for wanting to include this. Um, uh, first, this is not my family. It's not my loss. It didn't necessarily happen to me. And I wanna be careful and, and make sure I preface and say that because um, we need to really be I think more sensitive about how we're using images of uh, brothers and sisters that we've lost to you know, state and systemic violence. Um, the suffering that they were going through is an empath that was there putting my lens on them. Uh, that kind of pain um, is just indescribable. Uh, but when Vanity Fair and Ta-Nehisi Coates reached out to me, I had already been obsessively following the story because I just couldn't believe that everywhere I was watching, nobody was talking about this. I was just, you know, uh, it is also one year since I've been in my house under quarantine. I have not, I've only left my house two times. And the two times I left my home was one, to go to Kentucky to make the photographs with Breonna Taylor's family to honor her. And then the second time was the photograph of Dawu Bay. And so, um, the reason that it weighed so heavily on me is that I come from a, a family of women who want to be nurses, right? I have a niece that's an aspiring nurse. My mother was involved and she was a nurse's aide. Um, so it, it, it scared me, it bothered me, it terrified me that often, and, we, and me and my mother show this in the notion of family where she doesn't leave her house. She's sitting on the American Red Cross blanket with her cat. Like, we wake up in the morning understanding that we are under siege in this country. When we go outside, we're going to face microaggressions. And I don't know, maybe some of you are out there. Um, I wake up in the morning and I have to say to myself, do I want to just stay home within the safe space and the confines of my walls and hide away from America so I can avoid microaggressions and being accosted by white supremacy? Like the fact that as Black women, we have to wake up and our first thought is, do I want to go outside and engage with a society that doesn't see me, but yet wants to constantly attack me or make me a second class citizen or erase me? Like that should not have to be the first thought. And so I want people to really think about this. Brianna Taylor was 
home with her would have been fiance, Kenneth Walker. They were going to sleep when the police showed up after midnight. And not only did they show up after midnight, they chose to open fire from the, the front door of the house and the side of the house. So this bullet hole is her sister Janiyah's bedroom window. That's the bedroom window door frame. So when you come into this complex, the first two windows you see is that is her bedroom and then the second bedroom. So there's th that's what those two windows are. And then you go over around the staircase to enter the home, which is then one long like shotgun style hallway. For a police officer to choose, like Detective Hankinson, to choose to open fire on these bedroom windows. I know they were investigating this, so I know they knew where they were opening fire. I looked at the ballistic report about bullets like this, and this is why Janiyah and her aunt Bianca wanted me to photograph this. I didn't photograph this as some outsider looking for some emotional moment. Bianca asked me to, right? Janiyah pointed it out to me. Janiyah actually had the courage to stand between those two windows. She could have been in this room. Had she not been there, she would have been, she, she would have been murdered. She would have been dead because of that. And for her to have the courage to stand there with me, an outsider, a total stranger, and to point that out, like this is how I work collaboratively with people. I'm not going to go in and create an image that I want to take on my own account. If you tell me to do something, I will. She put on the t-shirt she wanted to be seen in. We stood at that balcony where her and her mother Tamika to recreate where Brianna stood when she had on that beautiful black dress that we saw circulating on the internet. And so what I was doing with them the day that I went was we, we had this beautiful visual procession remembering Brianna's um, kind of her coordinates and the way she moved around the city because this complex where she lived is outside of the city like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So I'm retracing her, what would have been her drive home? What would have been her drive to work? What would have been her drive or space hanging out with colleagues and like these parks and where these monuments were made for her? This whole procession and her family really drove me around the city for that day. And I think these portraits are actually a commemoration and an honoring of her. Um, there's another image. So that's the portrait where, that's the first portrait we made. And I, I gotta tell you all this. This is such <laughs> a communal photo shoot. Yeah, you see Tamika and Janiyah, but actually two of her friends are holding reflectors. They're holding my reflectors for me. So you see how their eyes are popping. That's her friend holding the reflector for me. And then the little kids were watching. And when I opened the camera case and they realized like it wasn't like a point and shoot, it was a medium format without a prism on it. So it's a waist level. And I'm like, I only get 10 shots per roll. It is over 90 degrees in heat. Like I am like sweating. And they patiently for hours lend their time to make these portraits and to make them as, as perfect as possible. And I can't stress that enough in, in being careful and sensitive in such an emotional situation of so much grief and loss and, and looking for justice to try to restore, the, restore it my way through a visual justice, through a reclamation of her humanity. She was asleep in bed and had gotten up to see behind Kenneth who was at the door when they opened fire. I've seen the additional footage, um, the way they handle her body. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to conceive that someone who is an EMT, go home and look at the definition of an EMT worker. When you look up that definition, then I want you to look up the relationship and the histories between law enforcement and people who work EMT. Because when you realize it, you'll notice, oh, they're colleagues, they all know each other. And to know that men and women in uniform would show up to a colleague in a community member's home in the middle of the night that they knew, even though they messed up the raid and the person was already arrested that they were looking for, they chose to do it anyway and show up and shoot a coworker, a colleague, someone in the community in cold blood multiple times, okay? And then leave the body there, not even bother to cover it up continue to search around the house as she laid there. 
these are these are beyond grievances. Yeah. And grief is not even a word to describe the pain that her family was in when I saw her mm. or saw them. And um, her family was just incredible because these are like pillars and strong, bold, courageous, beautiful black women, especially the way her aunt Bianca went out of the way to make sure that they were all right. And the way even that the attorney came, she came on each photograph with us as well. The attorney did. So this is like a, an incredible invisible force of black women all caring for each other. We don't know each other, but we, we, we feel it's the familial connection because of this kind of repression and being criminalized and attacked by the state. Mm -hmm. um, this image, and I wrote in my, my notes to the editor at Vanity Fair, um, I said that I think it's really important because the one thing I'll never be able to unhear, and I don't know how this feels for some of you out there, but the, the audio of, of Kenneth, if you recall, Kenneth is saying, somebody help, somebody help, somebody shot my girlfriend, I don't know who. He's saying this on a 911 call. Well, the people he's calling to ask for help from are the people who killed her. And then they turn around and accuse him of her murder and causing her death. And I will never, be able to unhear Kenneth crying in the phone like that. If you've ever heard that audio, if you've ever shared it with somebody or played it, you owe Kenneth Walker and you owe Breonna Taylor because we're consuming all of this. We, it is unfathomable to understand the pain that they were in. And I think that it is our job especially if we consume this story, to make sure Brianna's law is passed in every state. Call your representatives, look up Brianna's law, pass the law in every state. This portrait was made and the editors did not think I was gonna be able to make it. They said, there's no way you're gonna get access to Kenneth. I put a list together of what I was looking for and why I wanted to do it in my biography. And then I sent it to the attorney to share it with the family so they could decide if they wanted to be photographed by me. Well, Kenneth, they called Kenneth when I was there after we made the portraits at Brianna's apartment. Kenneth met me in a park not too many miles from there. And on the back of his car, which is a, a, a Dodge car that is the commemoration of Brianna, this beautiful red Dodge car, because that was her favorite car, but she had it in black. He decided that he was going to show me the wedding ring, but then he also brought me the baby shoes. A friend had gave them little baby Jordans, so when they had their firstborn, they would have these little shoes. And he, he, he said, the reason I came is because I, you know, heard about your list and your request. And he's like, I thought my mom asked for that. That sounds like something my mother would have wanted to photograph. And then his mom pulls up in the car. So like he understood and he hadn't been interviewed, hadn't talked to anybody because they were still trying to accuse him of firing the shot at the officer and blaming him for Brianna's death. So I'm seeing him right before people really get a chance to start interviewing him, but he felt compelled to come forward because I was acknowledging and honoring and trying to restore his humanity. I kept thinking about him when I was in that hotel, like only if I could find a way to restore this black man's humanity. He is not a criminal. Like these are sweethearts that met and were going to school together and had dreams together. He was about to propose to her, everybody. He was just about to to propose to her mm. and instead symbolically the state in the form of police officers shows up and kills her in the middle of the night when they're just sleeping and he was about to propose to her and they had these dreams and ideas of starting his family and like that's what he's telling me as I'm making this photograph and so I'm intentionally photographing bringing his humanity by the way I'm photographing his hand right the way he gingerly and tenderly is holding that beautiful engagement ring and you know just asking him to just turn it just a little slightly and you know switching my lens to make sure that it is the most elegant pristine black man's hand right 
Mm. And he was so soft and graceful and beautiful. And we laughed and smiled and talked about, you know, Brianna didn't believe that he was going to propose to her. And they was always talking about it. It was just, it was like visiting a family member. And they were all gathered around watching me shooting with their phones. But the fact that his mom pulled up and the fact that he came forward because he thought what I requested was something his mom would have wanted. That speaks to the true power of when you understand people's humanity and what is at stake, especially when they've been criminalized, when they've done no wrong. The last image that we have shows the uh, whole family there, right? In front of the mural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is an artist, another artist mural painted on an art building. <laughs> I'm always finding a way to honor other artists and mark art around, you know, current events and urgent topics. But here, I mean, to me, this was the best way to visualize Brianna. Mm. Um, since I couldn't see her, so I knew to go find this mural and in the, in the make it exactly at this site. And I want to speak to what is happening outside of this frame. I requested and sent in advance to her colleagues at the hospital where she worked that I would like white coats and other nurses and doctors to come forward to hold these signs. I wrote exactly what the signs would say, which is exactly what you see them holding in this image. Mm. They had it, they made the signs. Do you know right 15 minutes before we were all supposed to meet, they got a call, you can't do that photograph. So none of what her colleagues or white coats or people from this hospital are in the photograph because the higher ups on the publicity side and the legal side found out about the signs and who I was and that I was coming to make this portrait for Brianna's memory. And they told them, no, you can't participate. Mm -hmm. And I had heard all, all the stories about the people that knew her and worked with her, that they loved her, right? Her colleagues loved her and they were excited about her and they were, you know, sorry for her loss. So I was so dismayed and shocked when I was so transparent that all of a sudden, 15 minutes before we're supposed to make this portrait, they all are told no. And not only did they not come, they took the signs, they kept them. So it was Bianca who on the spot rewrote all of these signs. They brought over these empty ones. So the guy who lives in the building and the artist, they all got the markers and we have massed together to write it all exactly the way it should have been on the spot. Mm. But you see, they intimidated those workers. This health corporation and the local law enforcement intimidated her coworkers to the point that they wouldn't be in this photograph. And I don't know who told that I was there. I think maybe the advertisement side of the, comp the health company saw it. Mm. Um, also, I'm standing on a wall of a, another apartment building complex to get this shot at this angle. What started to occur once the people left who were supposed to be involved in the shot, some that came over after to say they weren't coming or to like bring the markers and the empty uh, signs, all of a sudden a police helicopter flies over me. Then all of a sudden, a local media reporter in a, in a news van pulls up and is watching me. Then all of a sudden, this other white guy comes up and he starts video taping me with the phone. I think what's amazing is that me and Brianna's family and friends, we're just honoring Brianna. So there's like multiple things happening here. We, they are trying to intimidate and surveil me, one. So you have to understand that, right? I'm putting myself at risk because it's a quarantine, a pandemic, and I have an illness where I can't be in heat and in the sunlight. And now the police know that I'm there making an image for Brianna and they're trying to intimidate us. But we internally within this portrait, we could care less. And we're all like focused on each other, right? The fact that we're reinforcing our safety and our space, regardless of all of this surveillance, right? The system at play of white supremacy watching us and hawking us as we're making this portrait and this commemoration, that to me is the resiliency and the beauty and the profound power in really trying to collaborate with everyday people. And you see, I requested that she hold Brianna's EMT jacket because I knew she had two. I distinctly remember hearing that they didn't believe after they killed her that she was EMT. They didn't know. Someone had to say that, 
right? You just killed one of your own. And so I said, bring me her jacket. Mm. And so what I have are two generations, two moms, two daughters holding each other down. Another friend who knew her holding the sign with the officer's name who delivered the fatal shot. And then their other family members and boyfriends standing there flanking them on guard, holding the other officer's names. And then I'm at an angle situating them right where her neck is under where her voice box would be. And then you see how I'm intentionally shooting it. So you see the cross that's around her neck, how it stands and kind of brings that cross with the cross that you see in the pavement. Mm -hmm. And actually what you see to the left, that looks like another shoulder. It's actually a mural of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And so this is how this is coming together. But sometimes what is central to an image and what an image is about is also what's happening at the edges and around the atmosphere. And so that's why this is an important way to honor and commemorate her because it is in the face of white supremacy. It is in the face of neoliberalism and capitalism. It is in the face of heteropatriarchy that we dare to still stay steadfast regardless of the persecution we face on a daily basis in America. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I um, wanted to make sure that we didn't end before I asked if you could talk a little bit about what you're working on now. Oh yeah. <laughs> so right now I'm um, just waiting for this vaccination. <laughs> because the thing that's near and dear and important to me at this moment is making work uh, about health equity, right? Healthcare equity. We see it with the way this vaccination has been disseminated and who received it first and the complexities of others that are having a hard time getting access to it. So I want to talk about um, the vaccination, about COVID-19, about the people who were most impacted by it and, and killed by it, which are those who had pre-existing conditions. And in order to tell that story, to re-report to re the pandemic, um, I'm gonna work with uh, community healthcare workers. And so as soon as I can get vaccinated, I'm gonna be out there interviewing them and making portraits with them in their community so people can learn about who community healthcare workers are because there's a hierarchy in our healthcare system. And the people who are on the ground getting people to, to become comfortable enough to take the vaccine are actually community healthcare workers and they deserve to be visible and to be heard by the, by the country. Awesome. I can't wait to see it. Um, I, I, I think we've gone a bit over, but I, uh, I didn't want to stop you. That was amazing. And I um, will uh, start the q and I think we only have time for a few questions, but I did want to read one comment, uh, which is from Kimberly Mezik, uh, who said, uh, please just tell Latoya that I appreciate her advocacy through her art. Her gaze is helping to tell such important stories. And then um, the next uh, question is from Jennifer Cornwell, uh, who says, hearing your experience growing up in Braddock and seeing the photos of you and your mother and grandmother make me think of the idea of trauma that is so profound that it becomes heritable, not only in an environmental or social sense, but also in a genetic sense. Flipping the valence of that idea, do you think that hope, whatever the sources of it, might also be heritable. Absolutely, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I mean, that's what my grandmother Ruby made possible. Yeah. Amazing. Exactly. Oh, awesome. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, great uh, uh, feedback, mostly. Not so many. Not so many questions. People, everyone wants you to run for president. <laughs> oh no! Artists are much more powerful than politicians. <laughs> Don't let the politicians fool you. Art can change a lot of things, okay? Um, a very practical question. Uh, the course that you took with Oakley, um, uh, what, was, what was the course about? Well, it's not a, it's not a course. It's a, a program. And um, again, th that day he chose to talk about the, the Black Audio Collective out of London. Um, and Hamsworth's song, it's an incredible 
film. And I think it was important for me to see it as a Black American because I had never seen the footage and artist collectors working in a way that exposed the same way that Black people of the diaspora in London in the United Kingdom are facing the same type of police brutality. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm indebted to Opie for opening my eyes to that on a larger global scale. Awesome. Well, that's the last question. Um, everyone else is just saying how how how, <laughs> how wonderful this was and 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 how important your work is, and I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you so much, Latoya. Um, this is so thank great. So much, Margo. Thank you for the brilliant questions and the conversation. And thanks for those of you that are out there. It looks like a lot of folks showed up. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. All right. Bye. <laughs>